So good evening everyone. Welcome to the second week on live problem solving session on gate metallurgical engineering. I am Santra Krishnan and these live sessions are brought to you in association with PMRF and NPTEL. So I've mentioned this, uh, I've mentioned in last week, every Thursday from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. we will be having the live problem solving session and I'm sure it will be helpful for all the students who are planning to appear for Gate Metallurgical Engineering 2023. Therefore, whenever you find time, please try to attend these sessions and also inform your friends and colleagues who are planning to attend the Gate examination. So last week we had discussed four questions and I hope all of you have gone through those four questions and practiced them. And in case you find any doubts, please do email me. I shall try to explain as much to my knowledge. So on that note, let us move on to the questions of this week. So the first question is, the second peak in the powder diffraction pattern of an FCC metal occurs at a Bragg angle theta. We have to answer in degrees and the answer should be up to two decimal places. And also it is given that copper K alpha is equal to 0.154 nanometer and the lattice parameter of the metal is 0.36 nanometer. This question was asked in Gate Metallurgical Engineering 2017 for one mark. So what we have to find out here is where the second peak occurs in a powder diffraction experiment. So in order to find out where the peaks occur in powder diffraction experiments, it is necessary to familiarize with what is meant as extinction rules. So what are these extinction rules? So when you see the extinction rules, you will be able to understand that the peaks in an XRD pattern only occur at certain criterion. It doesn't occur at every two theta value. So this is a table of the extinction rules or it helps us in understanding allowed reflections and forbidden reflections for different unit cell types. So if you see the third row, we can see that for a phase centered unit cell, HKL will be all odd or all even and whenever HKL is mixed odd or mixed even, it is a forbidden reflection. So HKL denotes the Miller indices of the plane under consideration and whenever we are talking about extinction rules, remember that zero is considered as even. In that case, so what will be the first two theta value or which will be the plane denoting the first two theta value? It will be 1, 1, 1. That is the all odd case. So next is the, what is the next case? It will be 2, 0, 0. That is an all even set, right? Therefore, the first peak of FCC occurs on the plane 1, 1, 1. The second peak will occur at 2, 0, 0. Now that we have identified the HKL values, now we need to find out the equations that help us in finding out the theta value that is being asked here. So in order to find that, we need to know the Bragg's law. From the Bragg's law, we know that n lambda is equal to 2d sin theta, where n is the order of reflection and lambda is the wavelength. Unless mentioned otherwise, n is always to be taken as 1. That is the first order of reflection. So this is one particular equation that is required for solving this question. Next is the equation for D, that is the interplanar spacing. D is equal to A by root of H square plus K square plus L square, where A is the lattice parameter of the material under consideration and HKL denotes the plane under consideration, that is our Miller indices that we have identified here. So now that we have got the two equations required for solving, you may have found out that n lambda is equal to 2d sin theta where d can be substituted by a by root of h square plus k square plus l square. We have a, we have hkl values, therefore we have d and lambda is given to us. Therefore, the only term missing here is sin theta. Therefore, when we solve a is equal to 0.36 nanometers, d is equal to a by root of h square plus k square plus l square, for 0 0.36 divided by root of 2 square plus 0 plus 0. That is because the second peak occurs at 2, 0, 0. And we will get the value of D to be equal to 0.18 nanometer. And lambda is equal to 2D sine theta and N is equal to 1. And sine theta will be lambda divided by 2D. And theta will be sine inverse of lambda divided by 2 times D. Theta is equal to sine inverse of lambda divided by 2 times D. And hence, we have the theta value as 25.32 degrees. In the question, it was mentioned that the answer should be up to two decimal places. So whenever you're solving numerical questions, please be careful to read the requirement of the answer and write down your answer accordingly. 
and whenever there are a range of values there will be an acceptance range and please make the calculations very clearly include decimal points so that the final answer you get lies within the required range so that is the answer to this question i hope it is clear to all of you and so now we will move on to the next question the next question is arrange the magnetic moments of neighboring atoms in a one dimensional lattice group in group 1 to corresponding magnetic material in group 2 that is the question here we have been given certain arrangements of how the spins will be that is the magnetic moments are given in group 1 and the type of magnetism is given in group 2 we have to match these two so this is a very basic question i believe so even then let us go into the explanation of this question so the first thing is we have a table here which tells us about the type of magnetism the susceptibility the atomic or magnetic behavior and the certain examples and the susceptibility values so first one is diamagnetism what is diamagnetism diamagnetism is a very weak form of magnetism that is non-permanent and it will be existing only when there is an external field that is applied here the external field is given by h that is the direction is given by this arrow this is the external field and in a diamagnetic material the induced magnetic moment will be very very small and hence the susceptibility will be small and negative and also we should remember that these are the spin alignments so here we can see that h is in one direction and the yellow arrows are in the opposite direction Therefore, what we can say, it is oriented opposite to the direction of magnetic field. There is no net magnetism in the material. As we can see from the M and versus H graph, there is no net magnetism. And a few examples of this include gold, copper, etc. And we can see that susceptibility values are very small, that is 10 power minus 6. And they have a negative sign. So that is the diamagnetic material. So next comes paramagnetic material. For some materials, the each atom will possess a permanent dipole by virtue of incomplete cancellation of electron spin or orbital magnetic moments. So that is the case in paramagnetic material. Even though they possess a net magnetic moment, it should be noted that they are randomly oriented and as a result, most of them will cancel each other out. Only a few will remain uncancelled and as a result, the magnetism of the material will be very small. The induced magnetic moment is very small and it will be oriented in the same direction as that of the applied magnetic field. And the susceptibility will be small and positive. Certain examples include platinum, manganese, etc. So next we will move on to what is meant by ferromagnetism. In case of ferromagnetism, what are these? Certain metallic materials which possess a permanent magnetic moment in the absence of an external magnetic field. That is when even if we are not applying an external magnetic field, such materials will process a magnetic moment. And this manifestation will be very large. That is such materials will be having a very large magnetism in them. So that are the characteristics of ferromagnetism and they are displayed by materials like iron, nickel, cobalt and some rare earth metals such as gadolinium. So that is the case of ferromagnetism and here we can see a term known as Tc that is the Curie temperature. So below the Curie temperature this ferromagnetic property will exist and the spins are aligned parallel to in the magnetic domains that is inside each material the spins will be differentiated into different domains and all the domains in the material will be aligned in a parallel direction and therefore also we told that the magnetization of the such materials will be very high. The susceptibility is very large, they are positive. It is a function of the magnetic applied field as well as the microstructure of the material. If you see this arrow diagram, you can see that they all are, and all the domains are in the same direction. And see the susceptibility value, it is approximately 100,000, right? So it's a very high magnetization for the material. So next is antiferromagnetism. In antiferromagnetism also, the material will be different, uh, divided into different domains. But what happens is that the domains of different atoms or ions will be aligned in such a way that they are anti-parallel or opposite to each other. And also the magnitudes will be exactly the same such that the entire magnetism will be cancelled. So if you get time, just if you count out the number of arrows, the oppositely aligned arrows will be equal. And as a result, the material will lose its magnetic property. There won't be any net magnetization in the material. 
The susceptibility value is therefore small and positive. Atoms have mixed parallel and anti-parallel aligned magnetic moments. That is the issue. It gets cancelled. And this property also manifests below the Curie temperature. What happens above the Curie temperature is that all such kinds of materials will turn paramagnetic. That is, they will lose their alignment and lose their magnetism and all the spins will be randomly oriented. That is the case with anti-ferromagnetic materials. So next is ferrimagnetic material. Ferrimagnetic material also has the same kind of coupling that occurs in antiferromagnetism. There also nearby atoms or ions and their domains will get coupled with each other. But the difference is that the value of these magnetic moments won't be exactly same. See here we have one arrow is bigger than the other, which means that there will be some amount of uncancelled spin. As a result of which what happens if you count, there will be some more arrows in one particular direction and the other. As a result, the materials will have an amount of magnetization with them. The susceptibility will be large and positive like ferromagnetic materials. It is also a function of the applied field and microstructure. And such materials examples include barium. So that is the case with the different types of magnetism. Now that you have understood the different cases in magnetism, if we go back to our question, we can see what are these. These are randomly oriented. Immediately, you can say that they are paramagnetic. Now, what we have, they are equally oriented and they are parallel. That are ferromagnetic material, very strong magnetization. Next, anti-parallel material. Even though the material was initially having magnetic properties, since they got coupled and the coupling was in equal magnitude and opposite direction, all of the magnetism got lost and it became anti-ferromagnetic. So, next is we have anti-parallel, but still they are unequal. Arrows are of different sizes which means that there will be ferry magnetic so if you see all these options the answer will be what will be the answer the answer will be option b so i hope all of you are clear with the explanation for this question so with that let us move on to the next question for an intrinsic semiconductor the room temperature electrical conductivity is 10 power minus 6 ohm inverse meter inverse if the electron and hole mobilities are given as 0.75 and 0.06 meter square, V inverse and second inverse respectively, the intrinsic carrier concentration per meter cube at RT is RT's room temperature. So it was asked in Gate Metallurgical Engineering in 2017. For two marks, it is a very direct question and if you are familiar with equations for the conductivity of semiconductors, easily you can score two marks. It is a very direct question. All of that is required for solving is directly given in the question. And so if anybody remembers, we know that the conductivity equation for an intrinsic semiconductor is given by sigma is equal to mu e plus mu h e star n that is e multiplied by ni where mu e and mu h are the mobilities of the electron and hole respectively. E is the charge of an electron and ni is the intrinsic carrier concentration per meter cube. So we know that in intrinsic semiconductors, what, there are no external carriers that is generated by the incidence of light or any other property. It is only the carriers that are remaining in the material that is responsible for conductivity. We know that in a semiconducting material, intrinsically, naturally, only electrons and holes will be present and whatever the conductivity the material has is due to the electrons and holes and in an intrinsic material these values will be same that is electrons number of electrons will be equal to number of holes and therefore when base their mobilities are multiplied by charge and multiplied by the carrier concentration we will be getting the conductivity of the material so here conductivity is given as 10 power minus 6 ohm inverse meter inverse electron mobility is given Hall mobility is also given and if we substitute the value of E that is 1.6 into 10 power minus 19 we can the only thing remaining in this equation is Ni if we solve the equation we can say that it is equal to 10 power minus 6 divided by in the inside bracket 0 0.7 plus 0 0.06 into 1.6 into 10 power minus 19 sorry this should be in super crisp, uh, sorry superscript that is a my mistake so I'll correct it before uploading into the drive and we will get the value of Ni as 7.7810 into 10 power 12 meter cube. So actually I would like to correct it now itself so that later I don't forget. And just give me a moment to correct it into 10 power 12. And this was a superscript value. So 
So now it's correct, 7.78 into 10 power 12 per meter cube. That is the intrinsic carrier concentration that we require. So I hope it's clear to all of you. The main equation that we have to familiarize ourselves here is this particular equation for an intrinsic semiconductor. Once you know that equation, it will be very clear that you, by substituting these values directly, we will be getting the final answer. I hope it's clear for all of you. On that note, let us move on to the fourth and final question of this week. A single crystal FCC metal is subjected to sufficiently large tensile stress along the 111, sorry, 110 direction to activate some of the slip systems. Which one of the following slip systems will be activated? This was asked in Gate Metallurgical Engineering 2017 for two marks. So please read the question carefully. A single crystal FCC metal is subjected to sufficiently large tensile stress along the 110 direction to activate some of the slip section. So there is an FCC metal or there is a single crystal and we are pulling the single crystal in one particular direction. The direction of pulling is given. That is, it is subjected to sufficiently large tensile stress along the 110 direction that is given to us. And a set of slip systems are also given to us. That is, a direction is given to us and the particular plane along which it happens is also given to us. So based on, and we have to answer which one of the following slip systems will be activated. So when we are pulling the material, where will the dislocation start moving? That is what we have to find out. So square brackets denote the di direction and the curved brackets will give us the plane. So we have to find out some particular value related to each of these planes to decide whether the slip systems will be activated or not. So what are those values? So if you see, slip systems will be activated when the Schmidt factor is non-zero. So the Schmidt factor has to be calculated for all the four options. So what is this Schmidt factor? Schmidt factor is equal to, M is equal to cos phi cos lambda, where phi is the angle between normal to the given slip plane and the applied direction and lambda represents the angle between the given direction and the 110 direction. So let me be clear once more, Smith factor is calculated by M cos alpha cos lambda. If you see in this particular figure, phi is the angle. So this is the particular plane under consideration and normal to this plane is this green arrow. So phi is the angle between the normal to the plane under consideration and the direction in which the force is being applied. So direction in which force is being applied is 110, right? So and normal to the plane under consideration is this one. So phi is the angle between normal to the plane and the 110 direction. 110 direction is the direction in which the force is being applied. And here lambda represents the direction, sorry, angle between the given direction and the 110 direction. So along with these slip planes, we have also been given certain directions, right? So we have to calculate the angle between the given direction and the direction in which the force is applied. That particular angle is our lambda. So once you know these both angles, you will be able to calculate the value of M. And by calculating the value of M for which of the option it becomes non-zero, that plane will become activated. So in order to do that, here plane is given, direction is given, but normal to the slip plane is not given, right? So what is the normal to the slip plane? So in any case, for example, if you are considering the plane 111, normal to the slip plane is the direction 111. Basically, we have to calculate the angles only between direction. So this is the, suppose we are considering this is the 111 plane, that is the slanting portion is the 111 plane. Normal to that 111 plane will be the 111 direction. Therefore, phi will be between 111 direction and 110 direction. And for this option, Lambda will be the angle between 110 direction and 1 bar 110 direction. So I hope. So if you know these both angles, you will be able to calculate the Schmidt factor. So if you have noticed this, the Schmidt factor is very similar to the equation for the shear stress. That when we have an equation in material science for shear stress is equal to sigma into cos phi cos lambda. That shear stress. So here we are applying a tensile force, but whatever the kind of force we are applying, 
to any type of force and cell force compression force whatever it a shear force will always be associated and that shear force is given by a similar equation that is tau is equal to sigma into cos phi cos lambda and whenever the tau reaches a critical value slip will start so that is why the skip factor is given by m is equal to cos phi cos lambda. So from here you will be able to understand that m is equal to tau divided by sigma from the equation. So please do revise that particular section in material science and if you have any doubts please contact me. I will be glad to clear it. So in our question our only concern is the Smith factor. That is why I am limiting my discussion to this particular equation alone. So please do read about critical result shear stresses that is C S R R. I hope all of you have come across this term. So this Schmidt factor is very much related to that critical result shear stress. So there might be questions that have an overlap. So please be familiar with those concepts also. Here our concern is only m is equal to cos phi cos lambda. So now that we know we know what is the angle phi and cos lambda, we need to find out the values for cos phi and cos lambda. And the only thing given to us is the direction and the plane. So how to do that? So in mathematics, in general, for cubic unit cells, the angle between two directions, say represented by u1, v1, w1 and u2, v2, w2. We have two directions that is given in the square brackets. One direction is u1, v1, w1 and u2, v2, w2. And for finding the angle between them, we have a mathematical equation. Suppose the angle is theta between these two directions. And to find the angle, we have a mathematical equation that is theta is equal to cos inverse u1, u2, v1, v2, w1, w2, their sum divided by the root of all of this square plus or into all of this square. So in general, if we have two directions, u1, v1, w1 and u2, v2, w2, in order to find the angle theta between them, we have to find the value of cos inverse u1, u2 plus v1, v2 plus w1, w2 divided by the root of u1 square plus v1 square plus w1 square into u2 square plus v2 square plus w2 square. So here we have to find both phi and both lambda and each time the set of two directions we will be taking will be different. And hence we will be using the same equation for finding the value of the Smith factor that is u1, u1, u2, v1, v2 and w1, w1 for, w1, w2 for both phi as well as for lambda. So in case and the I'm sorry, in case of phi, we will be taking the direction this one and the direction this one. In case of lambda, we will be taking the direction this one and the slip direction. So the slip direction and the normal to slip plane are given in your options. And this direction of this red dark arrow, that is the applied tensile stress is given in the question. So please remember that this one is given in the question and this for two, that is the green one and the slip direction will be given in your options. We have to substitute each of the options and find out the value of this as well as this and take their product to get the M value. So if we see this particular question, say that your slip plane is 110 and you have a plane like this, normal to the plane will be direction 110 and slip direction is given to us in the question. And this is the direction of applied stress. The sigma, you see, direction of applied stress, that is the dark green arrow over here. Normal to the slip plane is this one. And the angle between these two will be your phi value. And the angle between the direction that is given in the option and the direction of applied stress will be your lambda. So on that note, if you substitute for option A, so if you see here, that is... No, sorry, um, there it is, where it is. Yeah, so your first option was 1 bar 10 1, and 111. 1, 1. So 1 bar 10 1, 0, and 111 1, 1 will go like this 1 bar is minus 1, 1 bar 10 1, and 111. 1, 1. We are substituting. So, like likewise, we have to substitute for option B 0, 1, 1, and 1, 1, 1 bar. That is, here we have 0, 1, 1, and 1 bar 1, 1 sorry 1 1 1 1 bar 1 1 sorry that is the case so for each of the options we have to substitute u1 v1 w1 and u2 v2 w2 for option a it will be 0 please note for option b while substituting you will be getting as 1 by root 6 for option c it is again 0 and for option D, it is again zero. So initially, we had told that whenever the Smith factor is non-zero, the slip will get activated on that particular plane in that particular direction. Therefore, our answer will be option B, right? 
so our option b will be which one of the following slip system will be activated the direction 0 1 1 and the plane 1 1 1 bar will be activated so it's a, it's not a lengthy question it's just a lengthy explanation so don't get frightened for the time consumed for this particular question so it is that we have to, only thing we have to remember is the concepts that is related to critical result shear stress. When you know critical result shear stress, from that you will remember what is Schmidt factor. And from that you can remember that whenever Schmidt factor is non-zero, the slip system will be activated. The direction of the applied stress will be given in our question. And the possible options that you have to substitute are also given. So while substituting these set of values and with along with the set of values and finding the theta value for them using the cos inverse equation, whichever comes to be non-zero, that will be your final answer. So I hope it is clear to all of you, all four questions that we have discussed for all of you. I hope it's clear. And in case you have any suggestions, whether we need to increase the number of questions, reduce the number of questions, or whether I need to increase my speed or decrease my speed or any other particular portions that you want to be included in these sessions, please do write to me and write to me at santra.pmrfiatm at gmail.com. And one more thing is that there are video solutions being prepared for metallurgical students who wish to boost up their preparation for GATE 2023. Please do visit NPTEL GATE website and there you will be able to find the video solutions for the previous year questions. And along with the video solutions, we will be mentioning the NPTEL lectures from which these particular topics can be referred. So please make use of these resources. Hoping to see you next week. Please try to join. And that's all about today. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much.